All right. How's everybody doing today? Good. It's great to see you. Thank you for being here with us. Well, we're in this going through the gospel of Mark, and uh, today I want to talk to you about this thought, the power of belonging, the power of belonging. When I was a teenager and in my 20s, uh, from 1982 to 1993, there was a very popular American song um, or, or TV show that some of you probably watched, and it was set in a bar in Boston. It was called Cheers. How many of you ever saw that TV show? Very popular. One of the things that captured people, and I think this is kind of what I want to talk about today, in a line in the song, in the theme song, it said this, sometimes you just want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. I really believe that captures the need of the human heart, the way God has created us. I do realize that we live in a time of social media. We live in a time where uh, there's all kinds of uh, people saying that, now we got to get this fixed if we have to unplug it because uh, I will not be able to preach with that, okay? I'll be like, oh, squirrel, look at that. All right, so uh, I am like, I took an ADD test one time and it had 20 things that if you had like seven or eight of them, you had ADD. I got 19 out of 20, all right? So that, that just tells you a little bit about your pastor, okay? So, uh, but anyway, in this song, it said, uh, sometimes you just want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. That captures the human heart, the way God created us. We are designed to be in relationship, not just with God, but also with our fellow human beings. It describes, I believe, the need both spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and I believe even physically of the benefit of how God designed us to be in relationship, particularly in the church. And so that's what I'm talking about today, the power of belonging. Now, this is what God designed the church to be. Just like the song says, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came. And I believe that captures spiritually where we are. Not the going to a bar part, but actually the, uh, some of you are like, you're hoping that's what I meant, okay? Uh, but uh, I, I played this song, this little game when I was a kid. Do you remember the little game? Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors and there's no people. Cross the street to the bar, open the doors, there they are, all right? So uh, that, that's how I was raised, okay? So... Which reminds me of the four immutable laws of religion. You know what that, uh, those are? The four immutable laws of religion. Catholics do not recognize the Protestant church as the legitimate church. Protestants do not recognize the Pope as the vicar of Christ. Jewish people do not recognize Jesus as the true Messiah and Baptists do not recognize each other in the liquor store, all right? So, the four immutable laws of religion. Well, God designed you to belong, okay? And, and just as we are learning in our culture, with some of the advances that we have in social media and in technology, we see that there are some benefits, but there are also some costs, you know what I mean? It's, it's becoming pretty obvious that we live in a very connected generation online, but a very disconnected generation when it comes to personal relationships. And a person can have hundreds of friends online and thousands of likes and no personal true relationships in life. Well, God didn't design us to be that way, and this is not a message about social media, but it's about how that when you belong that it has great power in your life. Now, I believe spiritually speaking, it has great power, but also it has great power emotionally. Now, I'm not saying being a part of the church solves all of your emotional problems. All you got to do is look around. We got some psychos, right? you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, Rusty raised his hand back there in the back. If you volunteer to be as a psycho, you're probably not a psycho. It's the people that don't volunteer that we have to worry about, right? Um, but truthfully, seriously, there are some emotional benefits. There are some social benefits. I believe even physical benefits. Did you know that 
modern science proves that being in those kinds of relationships or having relationships helps you live longer. It really does. That's why some old married couples won't ever let go. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I've been living around and, you know, um, it's just like somebody uh, earlier saying that, you know, they were wanting to get a hearing aid so they could hear their spouse better. And this was saying it to a man, and he was like, why? <laughs> you know, why? Well, the truth is, God designed you to belong. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 2, verse 19. And this is from the Living Bible. It says, you belong in God's household with every other Christian. You belong. There's power in belonging. Now, what are some of the benefits of belonging? Well, this is not really a list in my message, but let me just give you a few of the benefits. You get support and encouragement. Did you know that the, the Greek word for fellowship, the word koinonia, it means to come alongside of. And when you're fellowshipping, you're coming alongside of. That's relationship. That's participation. That's benefit. And that's what God does in the church. One of the benefits. You get fellowship. You get support. And I've seen people that had no support in their life when they, and by the way, it's inevitable that you're going to go through problems. It's inevitable that difficulties are going to come. But the question is, will there be somebody there for you when you go through them? Will there be somebody there to support you, to be in prayer for you? That's one of the benefits of belonging to a church, because what God does is He helps us to survive. He helps us to thrive. He helps us to grow. Then we get to develop the use of our spiritual gifts. Think about this. If God gives every believer at least one spiritual gift, and the Bible teaches that He does, then apart from the church, how are you going to use that? God didn't give you a spiritual gift just for your own selfish means or your own selfish gain. He gave you a spiritual gift to use for the body of Christ, to build up others. And by the way, that's what all spiritual gifts are for. They're to build up the body of Jesus Christ. And so a spiritual gift is supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. You may have natural talent. I'm sure you do. Everybody does have some kind of talent. But the truth is, a spiritual gift is not the same as a natural talent. Now, they can coincide. I have the gift of of preaching and teaching, but also even if I didn't have the supernatural gift of being able to explain the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, I still have the ability naturally to speak publicly. I started doing it when I was a kid. And, and so, but the difference is one is a natural talent. The other is a supernaturally empowered gift from the Holy Spirit of God. And I have seen throughout my uh, life Thousands of people respond to the gospel. And sometimes I wasn't even talking about salvation. I was talking about something like tithing and people would get saved. Why is that? Because that is a supernatural impartation dwelling in the Holy Spirit in my life that through the power of the Spirit empowers and blesses the body of Christ. So you have a spiritual gift. It may not be the same as mine, but you have a gift. And so the question is, if God has given you a spiritual gift, and he has at least one, what are you doing with it? If you're not using it in the church, you don't really have the ability to use it the way God intended. We get spiritual protection from godly leaders. That's a benefit of being in a church. Uh, we get the accountability that helps us grow. I've learned a long time ago that if you don't have accountability partners or someone that you're reporting to or someone that's holding you accountable, you won't do what you're supposed to do. There's just human nature. Now, let's take a, a truth test. How many have ever gone on a diet or tried to change your eating habits, but you didn't have an accountability partner? You said to yourself, I can do this on Monday, I'm doing this, and you lasted less than a week. Raise your hand. Anybody like that? Okay, I got my hand. I probably should raise both hands. The fact is, that demonstrates to us the power of accountability. If you want to be able to be consistent in reading your Bible, if you want to be consistent in prayer, if you want to be consistent in serving 
and be consistent in how you treat others and being kind. And well, I could just go down the list. You get that accountability, that encouragement by being a part of the church. By the way, the word church, it simply means the gathering. So a church is not a building. We drive by this building and say, well, there's the church. Well, this is a building. It's not really the church. The church is the gathering of believers. That's what it means. And so when you are a part of that, it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, we get to cooperate in worship and, and have corporate worship that helps us get through the week. Now, I've said this. If the church, if Christianity was just about hearing preaching and hearing worship music or, or worshiping that way, then yes, you wouldn't need the church. You get that online. You can listen to a podcast. You can listen to a song. You can listen to the radio, for those of you that still listen to the radio, all right? But the point is this. The church is about more than that. The church is the gathering. It is being a part. It is participating. It's not just having your name on a roll, but rather it's about being a part of the body. And you get to have corporate worship. And what I found about that corporate worship is it always helps me get through the week. I mean, because during the week, you're going to face some problems. During the week, you're going to have people that are not, let's just say it this way, they're not church-minded. You're going to have people that oppose you. You're going to have people that aggravate you. You're going to have people that talk in a way that brings you down. But when you have a body a gathering, you're able to make it through, okay? So it's one of the benefits. We get friendship and fellowship. We get discipleship through the teaching and application of the Word of God. We get help for our family. I dare say that the majority of you, I know this is true of me, but the majority of you, if your family has come to know Christ, the church has been a part of it. Let me just tell you about my family. Uh, my mom was a Christian when my mom and dad got married. She went to church, but my dad did not. So they didn't go to church when they got married. My mom did. My dad didn't. My dad had not been raised in church. He didn't go to church, I think, but a few times in his life. When my dad finally went to church as a family with us, I was a little boy, for the first time, listen to this, the first time he got saved. Now, there had been a man at his work that was witnessing to him, sharing the gospel with him, saying, Roger, you need to be saved. Roger, you need to be saved. Roger, can I pray for you? And my dad finally got saved. The church was there, okay? He went to church. He heard the gospel. The pastor led him to Christ. Well, after that, we started going to church. My sister and I both got saved. My wife got saved in, through the power of, and the fellowship, and the participation of the church. She was in church, even though she made a profession when she was young and didn't understand it when she was 18 years old. She got saved and baptized. Our children, we have three adult children, all three of them have been saved, not through the preaching of Billy Graham. Now, I'm for that. Not through some guy standing on the street corner holding up a sign that says, turn or burn or whatever they say, okay? But you know how my kids got saved? And I'm a pastor. They got saved through the participation of the church. That's why it's very important. The fact is, we see family saved. We see kids saved. We see our parents saved. We see our aunts and uncles. We see our friends reached through the church. It's the most effective tool for spreading the gospel there is. God designed the church. Uh, we get an avenue to reach family and friends and loved ones through the gospel. I could go on and on. These are benefits of being a part of belonging to a church. Now, here's the point and the truth. You cannot be the Christian that God wants you to be apart from the church. Now, I'm not suggesting that the church saves you because it doesn't. And I'm certainly not suggesting that uh, the church is perfect because it isn't. That's why we have this saying, this church is the perfect place for imperfect people. But I can say with all scriptural authority that if you're not a part of the church, you're not living the way God wants you to live. Not fully. 
I didn't say you were immoral. I didn't say you were out murdering people or robbing banks. I said that you cannot be what God wants you to be apart from it. That's the way God has designed us. Now I realize I'm preaching to the choir because here on this spring break weekend, uh, you're here. We've had two services. And so uh, a lot of people in your, sh- uh, in your shoes, you're very, very, very faithful. But I want you to see today that there's great power in the story we're going to talk about. In Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 33, there's this story about Jesus, and his family thinks he's off his rocker. The leadership thinks that he's crazy, that actually they think he's demon-possessed, and Jesus addresses it. And it's a very famous passage. You've heard at least somewhat uh, reference to it that a house divided against itself cannot stand. So let's begin reading in verse number 20 of Mark chapter 3. And one time Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather again. And soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. They were so busy. And when his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. Let me say, you're going to have family that do that to you when it comes to your relationship with God in the church. They're going to say, it's too much. They're asking too much. You realize they're manipulating you down there, right? You realize that. They're saying they're trying to take you away. By the way, do you know who part of his family was? The Bible says that he had brothers and sisters. That after Mary had Jesus, she had other children, okay? And did you know that one of his brother's name was James? Most likely James was here because James was very outspoken, He's very clear that during Jesus' life on this earth, during his ministry, he thought Jesus was wrong. He opposed Jesus. Not to the point of, you know, or not like just saying, well, I don't agree with him, but literally, as it shows here, try to stop him. But after the resurrection of Jesus, you know who one of the first people that began to believe and began to uh, live a different life, who got saved and became an incredible influence in the church, this very brother, James. He wrote the book of James. He was pastor of the church at Jerusalem. He became an incredible leader because of the power of change, the power of belonging. Whereas before, James didn't belong. He was kind of on the outskirts. He was on the opposing side. But after the resurrection, he became radically and completely committed. And so there's power in it. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. So his family said he's out of his mind. The religious leader said, this guy's demon possessed. He does this by the power of Satan. And Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan? Good question, right? A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Jesus is going somewhere with this. Because he is the strong man in this, the stronger man in this story, in this little illustration. He said, only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and plunder his house. Jesus became the one that plundered the house of Satan. He became the one that defeated Satan, the strong man. He was, Jesus was even stronger. You see, the devil is a liar. The Bible says that he's a liar. He's a murderer. And here's what Jesus said, that he has come only to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. What does Satan want to do? He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your relationship with God. If you get saved, he wants to steal what has been given to you. Not only that, he wants to kill your 
family, your relationships, your relationship with God. And he wants to destroy everything about you that brings glory to God, everything about you that brings success, everything about you that is good for you. He wants to destroy that in your life. He wants you dead. He wants you unsuccessful. He wants you put away out of a relationship with God. He wants to destroy your life. That's who he is. Who is the strong man? Jesus, the stronger man. He went into Satan's house, and he ripped away the very things that Jesus said Satan came to do. What did he, he's a murderer. And what did Jesus do? Well, he died, but then he conquered death. He got up out of the grave. He is a, a thief. What did Jesus do? He came to give us life and to give it abundantly. You see, Jesus is the stronger one in this little illustration. And then he goes on. He says, I tell you the truth. All sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he is possessed by an evil spirit. Once again, Jesus getting to the heart of the matter. I'll address this. We know this as the unpardonable sin. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then Jesus' mother and brothers came to him to see him, and they stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Now, get this. This is the core of what Jesus was really saying. And Jesus replied, who is my mother? Now, he didn't have amnesia. He didn't forget the name of his mother. He knew who Mary was. But he said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. And anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. He was talking about belonging. He was talking about the church. He was talking about how when we come into right relationship with God, that there are going to be some, th some things in our life. Yeah, there are going to be some crazies. There are going to be people that accuse you of things that are not true. There are going to be barriers. There are going to be problems. But you can guarantee that everything in your life is worth the struggle for you to be where God wants you to be. Let me just give you three points, and I'm done. Barriers to belonging. Do you know that there are barriers to your belonging, especially to the church? There's misunderstood expectations. They said he's out of his mind. They're going to be people that misunderstand. When you begin to commit, when you begin to attend, when you begin to give, when you begin to serve, there are going to be people, well-meaning. Sometimes they're not really concerned about your well-being, though. They're concerned about their own conviction. They're concerned about that they not get dragged into this. But they're going to say, don't do that. It's too much. It's too far. They're asking far too much of you. There are misunderstood expectations. Sometimes people come into church and misunderstand the expectations. That They forget that they're serving the Lord, not man, not the pastor, not some group, okay? You're serving Jesus. And sometimes because we get our eyes on the wrong things, we get distracted, we get tired, and what happens? We want to quit. We want to throw in the towel. We want to say things like, I'm burned out. And I don't mean to mock that because I understand that in some cases that is a true thing. But burnout mostly is that we're not being filled properly. We're not being filled up more than we're giving out. And, and I'm not talking about the preaching. I'm not talking about the kind or style of music. But I'm talking about sitting at the feet of Jesus and being filled by Him. Because until you do that, you're not going to last. I don't care what it is. Uh, the first church I was senior pastor of, we had a man that was a Sunday school teacher. We had Sunday school. And he taught, I think it was fifth or sixth grade boys, or maybe it was fifth and sixth grade boys. And he did it for like 20 years. And the pattern was, and this happened every single year, uh, he'd start out with a certain number of boys, and by the end of the year, 
it would be way, 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 way down in attendance. Most of the time, way less than half of what he started with. And I began to look at this, and I'm like, what, what is the problem here? And I had a conversation with him one day. I, I, I brought him in. I said, look, I called his name. I said, um, we need to get somebody else to teach this fifth and sixth grade boys. And you know what he did? He looked at me and said, thank God. I said, that was a different reaction than I was expecting. He said, I only did this because they said nobody else would do it, and I've just been doing it for 20 years, and I'm no good at it. Well, at least he didn't quit, okay? Often there are misunderstood expectations when it comes to the church, right? And so you need to understand that there are barriers. There will be barriers. Then there's misplaced priorities. Our priority is to fear God, not man, okay? Our, our priority is to be in right relationship with God. We're to reject the lies of the enemy. Once again, remember what Jesus said about him. He's a murderer. He lies. He wants to kill. He wants to steal. And he wants to destroy. And everything that he says is a lie. But Jesus gives truth. And so we got to decide, are we going to listen to the lies of our enemy the lies that he tells, the manipulation of how he tries to destroy us, or are we going to listen to the truth of God? We often have misguided beliefs. You know what their problem was there, his family's problem especially? They didn't believe. The reason they were upset, the reason they said he's out of his mind, was because they didn't believe that he was really the Son of God. They didn't believe what he was saying. They didn't believe his claims. They're like, oh, Jesus, he's, you know how he is. He's just kind of off his rocker. He's out of his mind. Can you imagine that? And their problem was that they did not believe. Now, once the power of the resurrection took hold of them, they believed. They believed. And so what one of the barriers is to our belonging is often that we just simply don't believe. We don't believe what the Bible says about it. We don't believe that it's going to benefit us. We don't believe that our life will be better if we prioritize. I realize that we're busy and we got a lot of stuff to do, but the fact is, and I've said this, and this doesn't really have anything to do with the message, but you can get more done in six days than you can seven if you worship God. And I truly, truly believe that. It's a biblical principle. And so we've got to understand the barriers to belonging. Then there's blessings of belonging. You've got to recognize the value of your true family. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but we all got some crazy in our family, right? We've all got some problems. We've all got people that, look, if you're like, well, I can't think of anybody crazy in my family, I got bad news. You're the one, all right? So you're the one. But no, recognizing the value of your true family. And we all face this. Look, sometimes my church family is much closer than my biological family. Now, that's not because of a problem or because we don't like each other. But the truth is, my kids are adults, and they got their own life, and they live their own life, and often we don't see them nearly as much as we see our church family. Now, does it mean that we hate them, and does it mean they hate us? It just means that when you have a relationship, that becomes your true, true family. Um, you got to re receive the truth. It is at church that you receive the truth of the Word of God. you got to rest in the power of God. These are some blessings of belonging when you recognize that. And then finally, and I close with this, there's a battle for belonging. The enemy, the devil, is going to put up a battle. He is going to do everything he can. He did with Jesus. He had religious leaders that were accusing him of casting out Satan by the power of Satan, which doesn't even make sense. He had family members saying, this guy's crazy. He's out of his mind. They didn't understand. But the devil is going to try to make you, he's going to put up a barrier to your belief. He's going to put up a battle 
for your mind. He's going to do it. He's going to work hard at it. I, I talked about the unpardonable sin. This is really only applicable to people that reject Jesus. You say, what is the unpardonable sin? Is it murder? No. What is the unpardonable sin? Is it some heinous crime? No. What is the unpardonable sin? Something that a person would go to uh, prison for life for? No. You know what the unpardonable sin is? And there are so many people that do it, and they don't even realize it. It is rejecting the Holy Spirit, the drawing of the Holy Spirit is rejecting Jesus for the final time. You ever notice that when you start feeling conviction, maybe you go to church and you feel drawn to something, was well, really strong at first, right? And then if you say no before long, it gets easier and easier and easier to say no. And before long, you don't even think about it anymore. You know what the Bible calls that? It's called having a seared conscience. In other words, like taking a hot iron, like you would brand something, but they would sear, and when that searing happens, it takes away your feeling, your your sensitivity towards something, and that's exactly what happens to the human spirit. Here's what Jesus said. My spirit will not always strive with a man. What does that mean? It means that you can say no to him for the final time. That is the unpardonable sin when it comes to rejecting Jesus Christ. You're not a believer, and every time you've heard the gospel, you felt the drawing of the Holy Spirit, you felt and understood that you needed to be saved, but you're like, no, not yet. I got me some living to do. I'll do it later. I don't have time right now. And we come up with all these excuses, and we say no, and we say no. And we say no, and you know what eventually happens? You commit the unpardonable sin because you reject him for the last time. And that's what the unpardonable sin is. You reject him for the last time. Now, here's what I believe. If you're still alive, you've still got hope. If you're still breathing, God's not done. Okay? There's time for you to respond. Aren't you glad that God does that for salvation? Um, Man, I got a story. I'm going to try to tell it in 60 seconds. Kim and I went to a church in Hawaii. Tough job. Somebody's got to do it, right? But we met a guy on staff at that church, and uh, he was over their prison ministry. This was a man that had murdered someone and had been given life in prison without the possibility of parole. Without the possibility of parole. He said, well, how was he a pastor at this church. Well, he got saved in prison, and he began to live such an exemplary life. The governor of Hawaii actually pardoned this man. Pardoned him. He didn't just commute his sentence. He pardoned him. And that man was so grateful and began to serve God so much, he literally became a pastor at this incredible church that we were in there. You know what I think that shows? If God's not done with you, if you're still living, God's not done with you yet. Here's a man that thought there was no hope. He would never get out. And you know what God did? God said, nope, I'm not finished with you yet. Aren't you glad that God is a God of second chances? Aren't you glad that God isn't done with you yet? Oh, man, I'm so glad for that. Well, the last two thoughts. Jesus shows us the power and the need for unity, not uniformity. Uniformity leads to a cult, right? Uniformity is everybody's got to look exactly the same, wear the same haircut, like the same music, go to the same place. I mean, you know, I grew up in a church kind of like that. Kind of weird, to be honest with you. That's uniformity. That's not unity. Unity is around the person of Jesus Christ. You don't have to look the same, wear the same clothes. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Some of you just wouldn't look nearly as good as I do in this kind of pink shirt, all right? So some of you would be like, no, I'm not going to wear that. Thank God, all right? God doesn't require us to be exactly the same. There is no command in Scripture for uniformity. You don't all have to wear your hair the same way. You don't all have to dress exactly the same way. You don't all have to like exactly the same things. But man, we can be unified around Jesus. We can be unified around a purpose. 
And that's what God expects. And then the real problem with his earthly family was that they didn't believe. It's the problem of unbelief. I hope you will not be guilty of the problem of unbelief. There's a battle going on for your mind today. There's a battle. There's a battle for every believer's mind. There's a battle for um, your what you have spiritually. The devil wants to steal it. He's a liar. He's a thief. And he wants to destroy you. But you can commit this to Jesus Christ, and I believe that God will bless you for it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the truth of the Word of God. We thank you for what you've promised us in your Word. And Lord, I pray today that you would help all of us to understand the power of believing, the power of belonging, the power of being in relationship with you. Now, before I finish my prayer, maybe you're like one of the six individuals last week that prayed to receive Jesus Christ. Maybe today you'd say, Pastor, I need to be saved. I need to trust Christ. If you're online, click at the bottom of the screen. Let us know that you pray to receive Christ. If you're in the room today, put it on the card to let us know that you pray to receive Christ. You can say something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to save me, to receive me right now. Give me the faith to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. And, and if you prayed that prayer today, please let us know. And then we close with this. Don't forget about the prayer team. Don't forget about communion if you'd like to do that. But here's the question as you leave today. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? That's something we should think about every time we come to church. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is God bringing to your mind? What is God saying? You ought to do this. Remember, God's Spirit will not always strive with a man. And the unpardonable sin it doesn't apply to believers because you have responded. But I think that often, as believers even, we reject the working of the Holy Spirit, the wooing and the drawing of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we'll say, no, that doesn't make sense. No, I'm not going to do that. And we'll say no and no and no and no, until we become like a person with a seared conscience, a person that has had an iron that branded their mind, that burned their memories, that burned the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit of God. This is, I believe, one of the reasons why the Bible is so filled with this little sentence. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's not talking about physical hearing. He's talking about spiritual hearing. If you have ears to hear, Hear what the Word of God is saying to you. Respond to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I love you. I hope you'll come back next week, and uh, have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.